Hi, I'm Rick Milter, and I have failed. <laughs> and I'm really excited about looking for more failure opportunities in the near future. Because I believe that if you're always succeeding, you need to work harder, and you need to seek out greater opportunities to fail. It is only through failure that we learn. And not seeking out those failure opportunities is like being an athlete who smokes. You'll never know how good you can be unless you kick the habit. My goal is to challenge your thinking about the value and the benefit of seeking failure opportunities. As an educator, executive coach, and designer and facilitator of leadership development programs, I have met many enemies of failure. In fact, some of the most prominent senior leaders that I work with have a genuine disdain for the word failure. They experience failure as something that is very negative. And I help them work through that stumbling block because they need to, to become better leaders. Our journey for the next few minutes will be to have you experience some failure together and celebrate that. We'll then move to look at some historical examples of how failure really helps people succeed. And I'll leave you with a challenge, kind of a final assignment. So you ready to go? Let's start. On your programs, if you just turn them to the very back page, which is blank, the last two pages are blank, actually. Just kind of flip that over so you can write on it. Get your pen out. I'm going to ask you to really quickly do something. They didn't give you pens when you walked in. I was told they would. <laughs> I was told they would give you pens. Sorry about that. OK, so now some of you may have seen this before. That's OK. But on your pages, I want you to replicate what's on screen here. This is a fail test. Replicate those nine dots. Go ahead, just draw the nine dots on your page. And now very quickly, connect those dots with four straight lines without removing your pen from the page. Okay, the pen stays on the page. You connect all nine dots. I'll give you a few seconds to do this. I've given uh, some executives more time and sometimes they work through lunch before they they are uh, willing to allow me to give them the solution. We're not going to do that now. We don't have that kind of time. Okay, so how many of you have gotten the solution? Raise your hand if you've gotten the solution. How many of you have seen this before? Raise your hand and you still can't get the solution. All right. <laughs> you know why? You know why that is? It's because our brain has this cognitive heuristic, this shortcut in our thinking, uh, it's habitually formed, and it's very helpful. When we see things that look like a square, we, are, we draw the imaginary box. You've heard the expression, outside the box thinking? This is where it comes from. This is the exercise that has been in books for 50 or 60 years that led to that phrase, outside the box thinking. Let's try another one. Uh, if you could um, just uh, clasp your hands like this, kind of like this. OK, now, now just twiddle your thumbs in one direction, forward. Right, got it? Now, now twiddle your thumbs backwards. Might be a little more difficult, but you can still do that rather quickly, right? OK, now twiddle one thumb forward and the other one backwards. Do that at the same time. Can you say, anybody? It's a tough one. I know it's tough, OK? I have a friend who did this. His father, was a, uh, his father was a pastor, and he did this for hours on end on Sunday mornings while his father was giving his sermon, and finally, after months, learned to do it. OK, 
So those are two experiences we now share. Turn to the person next to you, give them a high five. Yes, we failed. All right. We have that experience. You've all, I'm assuming, ridden a bicycle, right? Now, we, you, they say if you, once you learn how to ride a bike, you never forget. You can always ride the bike. But do we ever talk about what it was like to learn to ride the bike? How many of you have read a book on bike riding? And that was your first instance of your learning process. How many of you had a lecture on here's how you ride a bike, and that's how you began uh, riding the bike? Uh, chances are you rode that bike because you failed in your attempts to, to learn to ride the bike. You realize, wow, I'm on this bike and it's a lot different from my tricycle because when I go like this, it doesn't turn, it just falls over. Okay. How many of you have learned to drive a car? Same sort of process, hopefully you didn't fall over in the car, but you had an opportunity to drive the car at some point. Now, I've never told anyone this, and my parents are, are now passed on, so they won't find out, but I learned to drive a car when I was 13 years old because my scoutmaster allowed the Boy Scouts to drive his vehicle on the back 40 of this farmer's land where we were camping. Uh, so by the time I went to my driver's ed class, I aced everything. And my dad thought, well, he's a quick learner. Well, I'd been driving for three years, Dad. I never told him that. Okay. Now, driving the car uh, is something that we do kind of pedantically, in a sense. We do read a, you can read a book on the, on the laws uh, on the, of the road and that sort of thing. But I'm going to take us through a quick model here. This framework uh, looks at consciousness and competence. And if we walk around this model from bottom left through bottom right, we're, we're working through a kind of a stage of learning that takes us through failures by definition. Unconscious incompetence is you just don't know what you don't know. Uh, and then we move from there. So that's when you're first in a car as a young toddler. You, they put you in the car seat, you're locked in, and you just get from point A to point B. You don't know how you got there. Later in life, maybe six years old, you start looking at the driver's uh, maneuvers, how, to, how that steering wheel, my mother used to drive like this all the time. I said, what is that? Well, it's, a, it's a, kind of an auto-correcting adjustment process that she used. She was a good driver. Um, but then we, so it's sort of a conscious incompetence. Wow, I'm watching what they do, but I know I can't do that yet because I can't yet reach the pedals. And then we move from that to conscious competence, where we now can reach the pedals. And if you're 13 like I was, you're driving on the back 40, uh, and it's kind of fun. And then we move to unconscious competence, where now I don't even think about all the things I used to think about, set the mirrors, make sure those are right, check behind me, uh, put it into drive, uh, make sure I first turned it on. Uh, make sure the radio is just the right, and then, you know, I don't think about all that. I just jump in and go uh, until you have an accident, and then we, that's another story. Okay. <laughs> so there are some things uh, that once you learn how to drive, you may need to learn how to drive another type of vehicle. In fact, there are some in this country that use the five-speed as an anti-theft system. It's built in. Who's going to steal this car? They can't even drive it. Failure was clearly in this person's life. This all happened in a couple years' time. And yet, he became one of the greatest presidents of our country. Failure was clearly in this individual's experience. And yet, he became one of the greatest, in fact, for most people, the greatest basketball player of all time. Failing at something does not make you a failure. Apollo 13, in, the ni in 1970, actually April 13, 1970, uh, accident on board, uh, three men uh, in space. We needed to bring those astronauts home. How to do that? Well, you, you know what happened? Uh, across the country, actually across the globe. Uh, people were concerned about this. NASA had developed 
hundreds of failure routines in which they were working through over the years and were prepared to respond to that failure. IBM computer called Deep Blue, it was before Watson. Deep Blue in 1997 beat the world champion chess master, Gary Kasparov, at chess in, a, in an official tournament. How did it do that? Well, Deep Blue was processing 200 million failure routines per second in order to do that. So what can we do? Well, if we always do what we've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. And I like Henry Ford's statement on this one. You'll always be who you've always been. So if you get good at something, and you keep doing it that way, and you're safe, you're never going to fail, you're never going to change. And you might get locked into the tyranny of expertise. The tyranny of expertise is when you get trapped in that bottom right quadrant where you're unconsciously competent, and that's all you need to know, and you're not aware that you've become unconsciously incompetent. Because the world is changing, folks. And there are no right answers to the most complex problems. There are many right answers. You've got to know which one to pick. Sometimes it's a matter of perspective. <laughs> one person's failure is another person's success. How will you know? Well, here's, here are two examples, and there are dozens of examples. Uh, Kellogg's Corn Flakes and 3M's Post-it Notes. Both came from failure incidents. In 2008, the commencement address at Harvard, these words were mentioned. Now, Hogwarts and Harvard, similar sorts of... <laughs> A pottery instructor once stepped into his uh, studio at the beginning of the course and said, all of you on the right, you will be judged on the final day of this class by the weight of the pottery that you bring to that class. If you bring in uh, 50 pounds of created artwork with the clay, you will get an A, 40 pounds of B and so on. Those of you here, you will be judged on the quality of one piece of pottery. So the end of the course came, and the students all brought their clay. All of these brought pounds of clay, pounds of, of uh, different pottery pieces. Everyone here brought one piece. These folks all spent very excruciating time in design mode and really kind of to appreciating what that final piece could be because it had to be perfect to be an A. These people brought in 50 different varieties, and guess where the quality was in the end? All the quality pieces were here. Zero from this group. They were all here because they learned by working the clay. By having the failed attempts, they learned to create quality. I found this sign on a wall in a biology laboratory. It caught my attention. Do we do that with education? Well, one of the things that I experienced in my work with uh, developing senior leaders, we have this, this game that we play. It's called ballpoint game. It's a game where we put uh, the team of uh, leaders together, and they have to pass a ping pong ball from a basket to everyone else. Everyone else has to touch this ping pong ball, but it has to have air time. So they can't just hand it to the person. 
And they also can't pass to the person standing right next to them. So it takes some doing. We give them about two minutes to prepare, and then we do five rounds of two minutes. And the first round, their, their, tie, their, their number, their count, tends to be like two or maybe 10. And then we ask them for an estimate. How many are you going to do next round? And they'll say, oh, maybe 12. Uh, and they'll do maybe 15. And then we, we give them a little feedback. And then the next round and the next round, they do five rounds. Guess what, how many they get in the fifth round? Usually over 100. And at the end of that, we say, well, if we'd given you all that prep time, two minutes plus one minute each time is a total of about uh, seven minutes. Up front, would you have been able to achieve over a 100 in the final round? And they all agree, no, no way. So the concept is, let's take an opportunity to prepare by failing. Let's jump in and try something with very little information initially, a little bit of planning, but let's try it. Let's experience it. Let's go back to learning to ride the bike. So I said I'd leave you with a challenge. My challenge to you is to consider failure as a true option. In Houston, during Apollo 13, the statement that was never made, but it was used in the film, failure is not an option, could only be made knowing that they will consider hundreds of failed options. So if your concern is, I want to be successful, my suggestion is work to find the failure opportunities. I used to live in Chicago. In Chicago, there's a, a political push toward vote early, vote often. I'd like to build on that sentiment. I'd like to suggest that you should fail early and fail often. And in that way, you will truly be able to succeed. The assignment is for you to talk to someone here during the lunch break and provide them a suggestion that you just came up with for a personal failure opportunity. Just make that a, an assignment, very simple, but think about it, because I believe that if you do work toward appreciating failure and celebrating your failure, you will have great success. Thank you. <laughs>